Welcome to my channel. I want to ask you a question. What would you say or what would you think if I told you that your own government is funding a Chinese invasion of America? Would you laugh? Would you say it was ridiculous? Would you say I'm crazy? Well, I spent a sleepless night thinking about this. And now I'm going to show it to you. And if when I'm done, you're not terrified, you're not outraged, then I think there's something wrong with you. But before I do that, I have to thank each and every one of you for coming to my channel. Thank you for watching my videos. Thank you for liking them, for commenting on them, for sharing them. Thank you especially to all of you who have subscribed to my channel. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. There's a place in Panama called the Darien Gap. Rather than explain it to you, I'm going to let Brett Weinstein explain it to you. If you don't know who Brett Weinstein is, he's a biology professor who, although he's a liberal, is interested in the truth, interested enough to spend his own money to go to the Darien Gap and find out what's going on. We're going to listen to this, and when we're done, we're going to talk about it. Is it's a physical place it's between panama and colombia and it is a gap in the pan american highway in other words if you want to get from south america to north america overland you have to go through the darien gap but it's very difficult and yet last year at least 520,000 migrants crossed it to come here how did that happen what is it what is going on in the darien gap it's the key in some ways to the story this immigration story well, almost no one has taken the time to go to the Darien Gap and find out what's happening there. Leave it to a world around biologist to do that, not a journalist, a biologist. That would be Dr. Brett Weinstein, who is the host, along with his wife, Heather, of the Dark Horse podcast. And he was just there last week because he wanted to see it for himself. And we're honored to have him join us now to tell us what he found. Dr. Weinstein, thank you so much. Very good to be back with you, Tucker. So can you, that was my feeble attempt to ad lib an explanation of the Darien Gap, but can you, can you, a little more precisely tell us what it is. Sure. Uh, you did a pretty good job. The Pan American Highway is a road that literally goes from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, to the southern tip of South America. It is unbroken but for a 60-mile stretch uh, between Panama and Colombia. It is not a canyon, as many people imagine the gap must be. It's an impenetrable piece of jungle, and the road has never been completed there, not because it's technically impossible to do, but because the combination of the difficulty of putting a road through that jungle and the, the danger of doing so has meant that North and South America have been separated in this way uh, for the entire history of that road. So you often hear people say it's a perilous journey to get across that 60 miles of the Darien Gap. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, it's beyond fair. Let's just say uh, I did my graduate work uh, not far from Darien. I did it in, in central Panama. And the jungle in the Darien Gap is some place that one um, does not go without careful preparation. It is uh, quite dangerous. It involves a number of conditions that make it perilous. For one thing, the Cordillera, which is the mountain range that is effectively the continental divide, the same continental divide that we see in Colorado, for example, continues down through Central America and it passes through Darien. So imagine a very uh, difficult jungle without proper trails through it in which migrants have to come up that mountain range and they're almost all unprepared. They don't have the kinds of materials you would want with you, so they're soaking wet from rain, they're sleeping on the ground, and so they get hypothermia. Um, it's extremely slippery, so people are constantly sliding down hills, breaking limbs. 
They sleep in their shoes and get trench foot. It's a very treacherous uh, journey, and the difficulty of it should not be underrated. So how did, I mean, you wonder why there's not a permanent team of New York Times reporters there trying to tell the rest of us what exactly is happening. <laughs> Half a million people move through there in one year. How did you wind up there? Well, I, I wound up there because <coughs> Michael Yan had been Excuse sending me, me materials uh, thinking that I would be interested in what was taking place in Panama. And, of course, I was utterly fascinated by what I was seeing. Now, some of your viewers may not know Michael. Michael is a former Green Beret who has refashioned himself. Well, the last time I was on your program, I talked about Goliath. Yes. And uh, if there's a Goliath... There's a David, and I would argue that Michael Yan is like David's eyes. He's been traversing the world trying to understand a story that as yet has no name. And that story is partially in the Darien of Panama, and it's all sorts of other places, including uh, in various UN installations. There, there's some story that is uh, difficult to piece together, and he's been he's been... Um, physically traveling to all of its various epicenters and showing people. So, And that is the story of mass migration. Uh, mass migration, I now think, is a piece of it. Now, when I went to Panama, I had a hard time explaining to myself why I was going because... Those are the best trips, aren't they? They Yes. <laughs> they, they, they are. The serendipity of it is is important. But it was hard for me to justify in my head going to such a place when it wasn't going to change, you know, the, the videos he had sent me were quite clear. Um, so what was it I was going to learn by standing there that I couldn't also learn by looking at these things? Well, I'm very glad I went because it did actually radically change my understanding of what I was looking at for reasons I better understand now. Um, it, one needs to see the uh, the physical relationship between the various sites that he showed us um, in order to really piece together what this story is. So you went, if I can summarize what I think you're saying, because you're a researcher and you wanted to know what's actually happening. Uh, the thing that gets de-emphasized when we talk about um, high-quality science is the degree to which it is f informed by well-tutored intuition. So I had a sense that I needed to see it for reasons that my conscious mind wasn't certain of at the time. And I followed that, and I'm, I'm very glad I did. Follow your instincts. Boy, that is, that is the lesson of so many moments in life. So what did you find, and what did you conclude? Well, uh, I concluded a number of things, and, and the whole thing was so um, mentally disruptive that I, I'm still in the process of unpacking what it was and debating with myself about what it means, but I'll, I'll give you um, some basics. But I, I do have to ask something of your audience. There's part of this that is just me reporting what I saw and what I learned from Michael and others on our trip, and there's part of it that's me speculating, and I'm trying to do it as responsibly as possible because a great deal hinges on what the actual explanation for what, what we looked at is. So when I'm speculating, I'm going to be careful to tell you that that's what I'm doing, and people should you know, treat hypotheses as hypotheses um, and, and nothing more. But the first place that this trip really changed my understanding was I went down thinking that I was going to see a migration and other people have called it an invasion and there is something troubling to me about the tension between these two things I mean which is it and I came away with the sense that it's probably literally both and the way that manifests is you have a massive movement of people through the Darien from Colombia now, I did not know when I went down. I now know that most of those people actually start in Ecuador. And the reason they start in Ecuador is that Ecuador has a policy where they don't require a visa. So people coming from all over the world can land in Quito, Ecuador, find their way through Colombia, move through the Darien, and if they survive it, which not all of them do, they can then get relatively directly all the way through Central America. Into now, at this point, you should be asking yourself a question. If somebody can come into Ecuador 
and then move through all of these South and Central American countries unmolested, not stopped by authorities. What's going on? The U.S. But that's not all that's going on. So we went to several of the, I guess you would call them, transit camps. These are places where people who have come by whatever route to Darien, where they uh, recover if they're injured and they have to accumulate money because even if they settle out on their journey with enough money to buy a bus ticket to get them through Central America, by the time they've come through Darien, almost all of them have been robbed and much worse, actually. People are being robbed, women are being raped, um, and lots of people are dying. The migrants talk about stepping over bodies in Darien, and for somebody with experience in these kinds of jungles, it's not hard to see how, without a support network, the kinds of stuff that can happen in a jungle can become uh, deadly very quickly. Things can spiral out of control. So you have all of these migrants from all over the world. Many of them are South American, but that is by no means the whole story. People are coming from the Middle East. We met Afghans. We met people from the Caribbean, Haitians. There are people from Yemen, Iran. It's shocking, really. This looks superficially like the migration of Central Americans that you and I remember from when we were kids. Yes. And there is some of that. Um, but that's not the whole story. Now, in um, there's a camp we went to called Canaan Membrio. It's on the Canaan River at the town of Membrio. And Canaan Membrio, we were allowed to walk around at will, and we could interact with the migrants um, at will. We were allowed to take pictures. There was no concern about this. We just had to check in with the Senna Front. The Senna Front is the Panamanian Border Authority. So... What he's saying here is they came to a transit camp in Panama and the Panamanian authorities said, you have free access, you can do whatever you want. But once we had checked in, uh, we were on our own and people were interested in talking, including migrants. So we had many conversations with migrants and these migrants, I, I have to tell you, when they come to the southern border of the U.S., um, they get through on the basis that they are political refugees. They aren't. When we talk to them in the transit camp, everybody tells the same story. They are fleeing um, economic collapse, and they are fleeing in the direction of what they perceive to be economic opportunity. And of course, in American law, these two things are very different. We protect people who are seeking political asylum, but we do not offer automatic economic asylum. And the reason for that is fairly clear, which is that in order to protect people economically, we end up robbing Americans of their economic well-being. And we, that's just not something that people are entitled to, no matter how much compassion you may have right. for people fleeing Venezuela. It is not... Um, our responsibility, especially not without some sort of a plan and agreement about how many people are going to come through and in what way we're going to take care of them and how that's going to get paid for, um, we, we don't uh, we don't do that. But in any case, you, you get the same story from everybody. They're they're fleeing uh, an economic crisis, and they're moving um, north. And many of them have terrible stories about what happened to them in the Darien Gap. So that's. Uh, one thing, and you see, if, when you go into this, this camp, Canam Embryo, you see the hallmark of the international community. You see NGO emblems all over the place, proudly American flags. They've paid for the water system, the, the toilets that are there. The United States government is facilitating this economic migration. And Did you hear that? Trust me. That's not the most frightening part. It's unmistakable, as is an organization called the IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration. It's a branch of the UN. And if so the UN and the US are paying for immigrants 
to come to America illegally. But that's not the most terrifying part. If you read their, their charter, you will discover that this organization believes that migration is an inherently good thing, that it's always good. And so they see it as their job to bring it about, to facilitate it. And in this case, that's particularly tragic because their uh, desire to induce people to migrate is causing people who are woefully unprepared for the Darien Gap to try to make that journey. And um, the, the humanitarian tragedy is, is immense. So the UN, of which the United States is, I think, the largest donor by far, mm -hmm. is paying for this with the U.S. government. Uh, apparently they are. Now, Panamanians are largely unaware. Some are aware that there's a migration, but in large measure, this migration, once it gets through the Darien Gap, boards buses, and effectively what I now understand is that all of the countries in Central America are effectively waving the migrants through because those migrants are not going to stop in these countries. As long as they keep going to the U.S., these countries are willing to remain silent about it. Now, in 1991, Heather and I actually traveled the other direction through Central America, through all of the countries south to, uh, to Costa Rica. And all of those borders are tightly controlled. Oh, I've been, yeah. Um, and so it is very surprising to find those controls are effectively lifted here. That's clearly the result of a massive coordination and um, of course, it's resulting in a large migration. So at this point, you should ask yourself, who's coordinating this? And why are they coordinating it? But what I was going to tell you about the fact that this migration doesn't appear to me. Call from three, four, six, five, nine, five. Sorry about that. When that phone rings, I have to answer. Through the Darien Gap, boards, buses, and effectively what I now understand is that all of the countries in Central America are effectively waving the migrants through because those migrants are not going to stop in these countries. As long as they keep going to the U.S., these countries are willing to remain silent about it. Now, in 1991, Heather and I actually traveled the other direction through Central America, through all of the countries south to, uh, to Costa Rica. And all of those borders are tightly controlled. Oh, I've been, yeah. Um, and so it is very surprising to find those controls are effectively lifted here. That's clearly the result of a massive coordination. And um, of course, it's resulting in a large migration. But what I was going to tell you about the fact that this migration doesn't appear to me to be just one thing is that we went to another camp called San Vicente. And everything in San Vicente is different than it was at Canaan Mambrio. San Vicente, first of all, it's not a town. This is a camp that is built as a transit camp. It's built of containers and various objects to house people. And it is almost entirely Chinese. Now, there were Chinese folks. Chinese? Chinese. That's a long way from China. It sure is. And what's more, in this camp, the rule that you're able to go in and walk around and talk to people is not in evidence. The Cenefront, the Panamanian border control, actually forbid us to go into the camp. So we had to stay on the outside of it. We were also forbidden to photograph. You getting this? The country of Panama is protecting a camp of Chinese who are coming to America and refusing to allow anyone to find out anything about them. So what photographs we have were uh, taken covertly. Um, but the most striking thing... Wait, may I ask this? So is it the government of China, do you believe, that's funding this? I... 
Well, let me tell you the other thing I found, and then I think the answer to that will become clearer. Outside of the San Vicente camp, the Chinese migrants are, um, you can interact with them. There are a couple of shops where they go to buy water or snacks or whatever. And so you can interact with them at those places. They are the opposite of forthcoming. They have no interest in talking to outsiders. And I've been to dangerous places before. I've been to places where people fear their government and can't talk to you because they feel it's not safe. This didn't feel like that at all. This felt like people who did not want to share information because it would be a mistake to do so. And what's more, there was an incident where Michael, who has lived in China, he's been all over the world, and he started up or tried to start up a conversation with uh, a guy who claimed to be from Korea. And Michael tripped him up and got him to speak Chinese. And then there was uproarious laughter at the fact um, that he had tried to pull this caper on Michael. So it is not a friendly migration. These uh, Chinese folks who are overwhelmingly male, military age, there are women present. I realized only this morning that in thinking back, I saw few, if any, children in the Chinese migration. They were everywhere in the other places we visited, but they were not present, as far as I remember, in the, in the San Vicente camp. So what I have pieced together, and this is a place where I'm going to speculate. This is a hypothesis. This is not a conclusion. But what I began to suspect was that the Chinese migration is actually being cloaked by the economic migration coming from South America. And that that um, is consistent with the observation that it has some different motivation. Now, I learned from Michael that the Chinese migrants in the San Vicente camp largely bypassed the Darien. They, because they have money, they, they can go by boat and they can skip most of the peril of the Darien Gap. And uh, in any case, it's a very different phenomenon. And to see it housed so separately is quite conspicuous. I do not know what the rationale for this Can you would estimate, be. do you have any sense of how many Chinese, these are Chinese nationals? They seem to be. How many did you see? Ish. <sighs> Talking 60 or 600 or? It's very hard to say because we were held at one edge of the camp. So I probably saw 150 faces, but the camp wow. is deeper. Now, Michael does some drone reconnaissance, and he's also been to this camp many times. Um, he would definitely be the person to ask in terms of a, a good estimate for how many of these folks there are, but um, the, the degree to which this is not consistent with a, well, let me back up a second. I regard the Chinese people as victims of an oppressive government that I fear for my own reasons. For sure. So I, there's nothing about the fact that these folks are Chinese that throws me. And if they were fleeing that government, um, I'm not sure what we should do about it, but I'm certainly supportive of their you desire. Would sympathy, I sure. would feel a great deal of sympathy. And in fact, I felt a great deal of sympathy for all of the other migrants um, that I met. But the sense of, it's really hard not to use the term hostility that I felt from the Chinese was particularly unsettling given that I know where they're headed, right? They're headed to the U.S. And j just to be totally clear on that point, this was not a, a work camp for a, you know, Chinese infrastructure project. And no, it, it, it was not. And um, what I know is taking place at the southern border of the U.S. Um, makes this even more disturbing because although the controls at the southern border are still there for those of us who are crossing legally, the lack of any control for those who are crossing um, illegally is stunning. So if I may just... 
<clears throat> I'm not going to play any more of this. I'll, I'll give you the link in the description. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I'll also give you a link to um, uh, Cheryl Atkinson's podcast where she talks to a sheriff over the county, the uh, Texas County where Eagle Pass is located, talking about immigration and what's going on down there at the border. To call it a disaster is while accurate, not complete. What's going on now, it appears from what we've learned, is that the U.S. government and the U.N. are funding a massive migration from all over the world, including countries that are hostile to the United States to America. Your own government is doing that. And not only are they doing that, but it is masking this migration is masking an invasion by the Chinese. Now, we don't know what those Chinese are doing. All we can do is speculate. But you and I both know people don't leave China of their own volition. So these people were most likely sent to South America by the Chinese government. And they are coming to America. And when they get to America, they're going to be allowed in without any questions. The question then becomes, what are they intending to do? And we can't know that because they won't tell us. But we can certainly speculate. Knowing how the communists work, I would not be at all surprised to find that some of these people are propaganda specialists that will spread information, quote-unquote, through social media and through other means, through news interviews, so forth, so on, to try and obfuscate what their intentions are and to try and make it to, to uh, play on the emotions of Americans to feel sorry for them. But since these are all military-age males and females... I can think of much more nefarious reasons why they're here. To surveil our military bases here in America. To prepare America for a massive invasion from China. Remember, this is all speculation. But what is not speculation is that the U.S. government and the U.N. are funding a mass migration that is being used to obfuscate an actual invasion of our country. If that doesn't make you angry, if that doesn't infuriate you, if that doesn't terrify you, there's something wrong with you. You tell me in the comments, what is the purpose of all these military-age males from China being sent over here by their own government and being brought into America and America welcoming them with, welcoming them with open arms? What is the purpose of that? Is it to make friends with us? You think so? You tell me in the comments. What do you think is going on? I'll tell you what I think. 
I think we are being invaded. I think that they are coming into our country and they're setting up cells all over the nation to prepare for an invasion. And when the time is right, when the seeds have been planted and when enough damage has been done internally, it'll be Katie bar the door. These are troubling times. You should talk to your senator. You should talk to your representative. You should send the video, the, the interview with Brett Weinstein to them, and you should ask them, what are you going to do about this now? And you should demand that they answer you, and not with the pablum they usually send, with a succinct and brief and to the point answer to your question. Americans all over this country should be descending upon Congress and demanding answers right now to what is going on. As for me and mine, I know that God will keep us safe and will protect us no matter what happens to our country. And as sad as it is to me to see my country being lost, I'm not worried about my life personally. I'm not worried about the lives of my wife and my children and my grandchildren. I know God will protect us all. And I pray, I pray, I pray so hard that he'll do the same for you because we have troubling times coming. I pray that you will be abundant. I pray that you'll be, that you'll live a long life, that you'll be healthy. I pray that God will keep you safe from harm no matter what happens to America. And I pray that he'll do the same for every person that you love. And I also pray that you'll be anxious for nothing as I am. That through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you'll let your request be known to God, that you'll tell God what you need and what you want. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era vet out. <laughs>